film and an actual 35 millimeter camera. <laughs> so um, I'm not gonna get into a lot of technical stuff today, but I'm going to um, focus mostly on composition and, and just some tips uh, for how you take better pictures, whether it's your own garden or maybe you're doing a garden tour. So we'll get started. Go ahead and push the space. Nothing's happening over it. Why is nothing happening? Hmm. Sure. Ready? Hey. I think it's on. Where? I think it's on self timer. I've got to stop it. Uh, exit full screen. Hold on a sec, guys. <laughs> They're accustomed to this. Either side of the numbers. Okay. Yeah. Would, oh, it's never done that before. Okay. So we'll we'll try that. Thank you. Okay. So the outline we're going to cover why photography, choosing a camera, rules of composition, light, detractors, and editing. Now my little arrows. So why photograph a garden? Oh. Everybody probably has their own reasons. We know Janet's reasons, so she can speak at mini college. Um, Destin Marks is the famous photographer, landscape photographer from Australia, and he says, photography is the story I fail to put into words. Oh. And we all know that a picture speaks a thousand, or is worth a thousand words. Just mm -hmm. thinking about the plant fail and the photos of dahlias, and people could look at the tuber mm -hmm. and have no idea what that flower is going to look like. But as soon as they saw the photos on the wall, it was so much easier to sell those dahlias. So um, you can try to describe a dahlia all day long, but the photo just says it all. So why photograph a garden? Now we're caught up. We might want to capture the wildlife in the garden. I take a lot of photos of wildlife, especially bees. I must have hundreds, literally hundreds of photos of little bee butts <laughs> um, picking out of flowers and a lot of birds. I have more pictures of birds and bees than of my children in my <laughs> photo repertoire. Sorry, are we supposed to be seeing slides? You can't see anything? No. Oh, you're kidding. No. <clears throat> but we are paying attention. Oh, did to I you. not share? Hold on, <laughs> there, Hold on. There's a lot of there's a lot of background noise too. Maybe people could all mute. Everybody's yes. not muted. Please mute. Okay. I'm noticing the background noise. I think it would be helpful if Dan could yeah. mute while Nancy is presenting. And wait a second, I can't hear you. Hold on. Where's my share screen? I have it right here. Oh no, down below. Yeah. Oh, here. And you're on mute. Oh. Yeah. There. Sorry, guys. Share. We need now, the extension office to mute. Oh, yeah. And am I yes. muted? No, you're good. You can hear me. Yep. Okay. Now I'm going to mute. Okay. Now you can see it, right? Okay. So this is what we're going to cover. There's the outline I talked about already. <clears throat> And why would you want to photograph a garden? Everybody has a different reason. Photography is the story I fail to put into words. And I talked about the photos of Dahlia plant sale. Yeah, huge one. And capturing wildlife is one of the reasons I take a lot of photos in my garden. Uh, sometimes I go out with the intention to take pictures. And I, other times I just happen to have my phone with me. Yeah. So I probably take a majority of photos with my phone because I'll be walking through weeding and there's an, a great picture of a bee or something or a bloom. Um, other days I go, I grab my 35 millimeter camera and I go out with the intention if the light is good or it's just rained. Um, Another reason might be to record the growth, rotations, harvest, or 
simply because you have a bad memory like me and can't remember when that flower bloomed or what you planted in that vegetable bed last year, you can look through your photos and easily remember, oh yeah, I put cabbage in the bed last year. I don't want to put that there this year. Uh, the center photo, interestingly enough, is from Monticello uh, Jefferson's farm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's not my backyard. And I read that he recorded planting over 330 different vegetables. And I didn't know there were that many. Oh. Oops, I went the wrong way. Long arrow. Uh, there's that lovely begonia. Can I get rid of this thing at the top, Alan? Um, it's not on my screen. I think it's only on your screen. Okay. So I can't read what I have there. Um, you might want to print or frame a picture that you've taken in your garden to use it for artwork. Um, I paint and I haven't painted for a long time, but I have a lot of photos I can look through and see if I might find a subject that I'd like to paint. Other uh, ones uh, are for visual journals. I might want to record again what day something bloomed or just take a walk through my garden and take a lot of photos of a certain day. Um, this, uh, the, the slides on the right are a trip I took to the Desert Botanical Garden in Arizona and there was a Tehuli glass display. So I took a lot of photos of that. Unfortunately, it was in the Arizona sun, so everything was in full sun. Yeah. So some of it was hard to capture. Another reason you might want to document the seasons, the changes, bloom times of certain plants. See, I can't see my arrow when it goes away. I also take a lot of photos of progress in my garden um, just to look at in January. <laughs> Remember, oh yeah, that's what it used to look like. Um, and, and think back to all the work I've done and, and how it looks now. So the top left photo is taken before we actually purchased the house. And the bottom right is actually two years ago. So it looks a little different now, but made some progress. And you might want to take pictures just for fun. This was a garden tour at the coast. I, sorry, I don't remember the name. Um, somewhere between Yahats and California, <laughs> but it was- it's a, Shore Acres. Yeah, I think that's it. And it was a beautiful, there was a house and a greenhouse yep. and, and just lovely garden, some very formal, but I walked up behind my family who were all just standing there gazing at the pond and I thought it was so cute and my daughter under the gun relief. So choosing a camera that's right for you, like I said, most, of the time I use my phone just because it's convenient, but sometimes I do um, walk out with my SLR, my digital camera and, and intend to take photos, if, especially if it's a nice day and there's good light. 85% of digital photos are taken with a smartphone. Whatever you choose, learn, get to know your equipment, really learn the settings and, and how you can use it to its full potential. Um, I'm one to just try things and not read directions. And I still haven't looked at the, the, um, the disc that I can watch my camera. So I'm, I'm just telling you what you should do, not what I do. And I do not recommend using the little handheld uh, digital cameras that were so popular before smartphones. Why? Because usually if you look at the, um, the pixel, this one says eight megapixels. Most phones these days are much better than those little point and shoot cameras. Okay. And I just have a cheap, um, what is my phone? Moto V, Moto G, and it takes very good photos, much better than my, um, my old little point and shoot. Darn arrows, come on. Oops, I think I skipped one. So getting serious, a digital camera offers more options, choices. So I have my camera here for those of you who can see me in the room. With a telephoto lens, you can get pictures you'd never get with a, a smartphone. Um, just the opportunities are there to get much closer. I just took the Tanager photo yesterday. Oh. 
Um, and I take a lot of pictures of birds. I love the hummers. This one's sitting in the snow in, in uh, December. Um, you, you can't get these photos with a smartphone. I don't think you'd ever get close enough. And you yeah. can zoom that picture once you've taken it. But, and my son is very much into photography and he has a super duper digital camera. Um, that zoom, every, every time you zoom it, it reduces the quality. Yeah. And it makes it very grainy. Yeah. So this, this tanager, I was probably sitting, I made a little blind with lawn chairs and I was probably from it, but still use my telephoto lens. So that is not like expanded at all other than what the lens uh, captured. And he came and visited. So photography versus taking pictures, what makes a good photo? This photo I did not take, it's a professional photo. But have you ever wondered how those photographers from garden magazines are so successful? What makes their pictures so great? Um, we're gonna talk about that. This one on the top left, uh, the composition is very pleasing and we'll talk about why. This one on the bottom, parts of it are in focus, parts of it are not, so it creates a wow. depth to the photo. Um, all of them are very equal in their light distribution. There's no shadows, there's no garish, you know, sunlight streaming in. We'll talk about that. So the rule of composition, uh, when I started to study this and restudy it, my photo books away. Um, some, some of the guides say there are six rules of composition. Some say there are 20 rules of composition and it varies, but these are the ones I consider the most important. The rule of third, uh, the golden ratio, lead in lines, cropping, framing, depth, diagonals, background, pattern, and repetition. And I'll give you examples of each of those. Come on. So the rule of third, what the heck is it doing? Well, we'll just leave it on this one. It's going without me. Um, is if you break your photo into window pane, three by three, and you've probably seen this on your smartphone, you can actually go to your settings and find a grid, usually is what it's called, uh -huh. and it will leave it right on your phone. So you can use these points, the PowerPoints, are the best place to place your PowerPoints are the best place that you want to capture the attention. Oh my gosh, it's skipping through now. I guess I have to just wait. Um, this is how your eye scans according to the rule of thirds. That top left quadrant is the most popular. Your eye goes there first. Oh. It varies, and I, I'm assuming that is because we learn to read from top to bottom, left to right. Huh. So it kind of makes sense that it goes from grade eight over from left to right, top to bottom. I don't think about that specifically when I take a photo, but when I take a photo or do a painting, I, my eye is, I'm so good and so trained that I do the rule of thirds almost just by habit. Um, photographers and landscape painters have used that rule for centuries, really, so painters especially. So here's the grid that you can, you can put on your phone if you're not used to it and, and kind of get used to practicing with it. And you can probably visualize the grid on these four photos. Uh -huh. Top two I did not take, the bottom two I did. Um, so Nancy, can you have Janet mute? I think it's we're getting feedback because she's not muted. Janet, are you muted? I think she is. Oh, I'm not. It's the extension oh, camera not. computer that is not muted. Now she is. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll try it now. So you can probably visualize the grid, especially on the hummingbird. If I drew a line here and Much here. Better. Can you hear me better? Yes, much okay. better. Great. His little eyeball is right in that top third quadrant. And then the plant over here is on the right hand um, third. This one we took in, I took in Mexico. That's my son. He's on the left lower right or lower left third. And then the palm tree forms the other third and the horizon forms 
the lower horizontal third. Um, Fibonacci spiral. How many of you have ever heard of Fibonacci? Yeah? Oh, good. Well, he's this Italian guy who invented the sequence or discovered a sequence sequence of numbers in the year about 12,000. And it's a sequence of numbers that begin with zero and one. When you add those two together, you get one. When you add one and one together, you get two. When you add one and two together, you get three and so on. When you add the, the previous two integers and keep on going into infinity, it creates this ever growing spiral. And it's very useful in art and photography. The golden ratio is a ratio of approximately 1.618 to one. And that's what happens when you add those numbers and, and keep on going into infinity. Um, and artists and painters and architects have used this ratio, like I said, for centuries. So you don't have to know the ratio to just visualize that, again, it's the grid um, and an ever increasing rectangles when you're thinking about your photos. I'm having trouble with my arrow. So here we have it with the Parthenon. Um, once you split the golden rectangle by the ratio, you can keep splitting it down forever. It produces, the, the spiral it produces matches the growth of a nautilus shell and is present in nature in many different ways. Uh, let's just say it's a math mathematical equation of aesthetically pleasing composition. So we're not gonna get into too much more math. But many famous photographers, including Ansel Adam, used this ratio in their landscape photos. And Janet happened to tell me <laughs> that Ansel Adam told one of his mentees, um, who was also quite a famous photographer, I forget his name now, um, put down your camera and take time to see your subject. So oftentimes I'll just walk around my garden and not take any pictures and then go back and try to capture the best one. So here are, here's the ratio represented in six different ways in nature. Gosh darn this arrow, it's not working. Forward. And there's three more. And a lot of the um, desert plants, it's very evident. What is going on? I guess I got to over here more. Forward, forward, there we go. And this is a photo I took with the bee on um, echinacea flower. The bee is in the, um, the smallest quadrant and then you can follow the spiral through the, the composition. Um, just remember it's a useful tool when you're trying to compose a photograph. Lead and lines are another way. You can use straight or curved lines to draw the eye through the photo and toward your focal point. It could be a river, stream, a man-made or a natural object. This one on the left is my garden. This bridge is my hubby and my two dogs. And I did not take the photo on the right, so I can't take credit for that. Cropping. If you don't take anything else away from tonight, take away cropping. It's probably the most powerful tool a photographer can use. Um, it eliminates your distractions and keeps your eye on only what's essential. Most of us try to take pictures that include too much. So keep that in mind. These are two photos I took of the same tree, a 300 and some year old olive tree in Mexico. Um, these I, this one I cropped in the lens, which means I took, took two separate photos, one getting closer, the one on the right, getting closer to the tree and getting rid of some of the, the distractions of the foliage and the light and coming through the branches um, and keeping only what's essential. This is a photo, the larger one that I took at almost sunrise, I was doing a booth the Saturday market for my dog clothing. And you can see the rack with the clothes and distractions and a, um, you know, a road closure and all this stuff in this photo. But I really liked the light coming through the trees. So when I got home, put it on my camera, I cropped it out and came up with that photo. So are there 
programs that you can. Yep, I'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. So these, this was done on my computer after I took the photos. Uh -huh. And the previous one of the olive trees was done in my camera, just eliminating things in the, in the shot. There's another one of cropping afterwards. Um, so this was taken with a telephoto lens, but it still had a lot of stuff in the background that was just distracting. So by cropping it afterwards in my computer, I ended up with just the little Hummer sitting on the grate on the fence and doesn't, doesn't have all the other non um, pleasing things in the photo. That makes a great difference. It does, really makes a great difference. Oh. Framing is another interesting way that you can um, kind of direct the eye to a subject or just an interesting, um, an interesting focal point on its own. These two were professional photos, the, the, the two arbors, and this one is, I took of my yard is a little off kilter. I should have, should have straightened it in my computer before I put it up there. But it draws focus to the subject by blocking out parts um, that you, the frame covers, basically, that you, you can't see, covers the image. These are frames in nature. I did take all of these photos. So the top one framed uh, by the two palm trees. This one, the branches just happened to frame the acorn woodpecker as he was sitting sitting there. This one in, um, it's the park in Utah with all the arches. Arches National Park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's and this one's in Yosemite with the frame, framing with the two, the valley basically coming down and, and framing the river. So it doesn't just have to be a garden. I consider nature a garden. Uh, depth is another thing that helps your photos. If you can create that sense that there's, it's not a flat field because the photo you're looking at is going to be flat, but perspective, leading your eye into the distance. We talked about leading lines a little bit. You can create depth by overlapping and again, uh, altering the focus. So not everything, not everything's in focus. Um, middle ground, background, and foreground. Depth of field is how much of your photo is in focus. And then overlapping the one on the right where there's a series of plants that are sta staggered in front of one another helps create depth. A couple of the same photos I've had before, but diagonals create a movement and the illusion of movement, again, in something that's flat, that's stagnant. And if you want to create like a rhythm and a movement, throw in some diagonals instead of just looking straight at something, consider an angle. And background, don't forget to pay attention to the background. You can crop some things out, but um, majority of the time, we don't notice things that make the background busy. So look around for a plain or unobstructed background and compose your shot so it doesn't distract or detract from the subject. My son took the photo in the middle. I love that little Hummer sitting on the um, obelisk yard ornament. Um, even the, the trillium, I took that photo at PV, I think. Um, get, get in close, try not to show too much dirt, other stuff. And then this one I took in my yard of the fig tree with, I could have taken it looking down or straight into the tree, but I love the way it looked against just the blue sky. So these are three photos of my front top tier garden. And what do you notice about all of them? that white van that is the bane of my existence <laughs> someone asked me once who came to visit are, are you under surveillance does it <laughs> i feel like it because it's there it's been there for 10 years it never moves it's just there so oh, really? when i it does move occasionally but that's where my neighbor parks it so oh. i have to be very mindful anytime i take a photo of that white van not only that but there's trash cans in this one in that little gap there's this chair that's out of place because I mowed the lawn and didn't put it back in this one. And the light is a great, I did like the way the light was coming through the trees. This is spring and fall, you can tell, and this one's spring. And then what do you notice about this one where I've got the red arrow pointing another distracting feature? 
Anybody notice? Mm -hmm. The shadows, yeah, very, very harsh light where I, I got the shadow of my palm tree that's out of the shot, the shadow of my house. Oh. So it's just not a good picture. I would delete that if I go back through my photos. Ah, oh, this arrow is not working. Okay, and pattern. I love taking pictures of pattern. Um, all of these were in my yard, except the two, the two desert ones. One was in my friend's yard in Arizona, the bottom one here, and this one was in an arboretum in uh, Washington, DC. Um, but most of them are radial patterns. This one, just the pattern of the overlapping leaves and stems. And I loved the shadow that shone on my house through my fatsia that's yeah, in a pot. Oh, yeah. um, so just be mindful and just pay attention of some things you can capture that we just walk by and don't pay much attention to. Repetition is another great thing to try to include in your photos. Uh, the one on the left is mine. This is taken at um, Adair Park where we take our dogs a lot with the three red maples just in a row there. And the other two are professional photos. We, um, but the, the trunks of the trees and then the arches repeating. Here we go again. And symmetry is another thing you can include in your photos. Um, all of them except the one with the man-made pond and the glass reflecting are just things that happen naturally. They're not, they're not perfectly symmetrical, but um, it's one, one of the ways that I break the rule of thirds. If I'm taking something that, a photo of something that's very symmetrical, I ignore the rule of thirds. And I want that, that picture as split down the middle as possible. Um, so the camellia blossoms just, I mean, they're almost like a mirror. They just happen to be growing that way. And then the tree on the right was taken in Mexico. And that is probably, I don't know, hundreds of years old. It's, it's just, the roots have just massed in the rock and there's no soil. It's, it was incredibly, um, but the guy who showed it to us said his dad was in his eighties and it was that size when his dad was little, so. Um, what is this? This is asymmetry. So some the, these pay more attention to the rule of thirds because they are asymmetrical, especially the, the bench is a professional photo again, but I took all the others. Um, the, you can see the, if I do a grid, that lower right quadrant would line up right there with the, the intersection of these leaves. The, the mushrooms are off to the side. They're not, you know, I didn't get right in the center of them. And then lighting, pay very close attention to lighting. If you, if you want to create mood, you can use backlighting, but backlighting can also backfire on you and it can, um, it can just make a, a mess of shadows. So be real careful. I mean, just take a lot of photos and then when you, when you download to your computer, throw out the bad ones. But I love taking photos of the light, um, especially in, in the forest coming through the trees. Here we go again. Why is it going backwards? Sorry guys, it's faulty. I'm hitting the forward arrow. Hmm. 44, 45, here we go. 46, 47. So here's lighting where you can create um, texture and contrast um yeah. with your shadows sometimes you don't want you know you try to avoid shadows but the one on the far right i really wanted those shadows i wanted to to split the picture it was almost symmetrical not quite and to see the shadows of that palm that was in my friend's yard in arizona and a few do's and don'ts we'll kind of do a little review here some of them will be familiar. Don't try to fit everything into one shot. It's tempting, but often too much. Same photo up close. Fill the frame and focus in on the subject matter. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Maybe if I use the arrow and try that. Yes. 
And my tomatoes, I actually grew one year. Again, too much on the left. It doesn't, doesn't show, it's not pleasing. The vine's going right down the middle of the picture. So I actually took this photo on the right from the top, looking down through the plant. And it's just a more pleasing composition with the vine kind of cutting through at an angle. Don't shoot from too far. Again, get up close, isolate your subject or the color that you're trying to capture. Uh, the one on the right is cropped after I took the photo. Not a lot, but um, and it's two separate photos. I couldn't find the one that I cropped the bee from. These are two separate photos again, but they show, again, a lot of distracting background on the one on the left. Zoom in and get close, and the flower is off center with the, the center of the flower right in that third sweet spot, the top left third. Again, don't, uh, this one's new, I guess. Don't shoot at eye level. I'm looking at time. Um, it can be boring. And I've also included too much distraction in the background in that yeah. photo. I've got my neighbor's van and canoe and my fence, and <laughs> it's not a good picture at all. But then I got close up to that spire of foxglove. Actually, under it, I was probably almost crouching or lying on the ground and shot it from below and it's much more interesting. And again, it's not centered, it's on that third sweet spot. Oops, I used my arrow. All of these, most of these were shot quite a bit from below. The, the daffodils were in a pot on my uh, balcony so I didn't have to lie on the ground, but sometimes I do and I kind of look around and make sure my neighbors are watching. <laughs> um, but I do get quite low when I take a lot of the photos. So one of the echinacea that's, um, is that fasciation that I learned in my master gardening class? It was um, the genetic, help me, fasciation is called, right? Where the plant grows flat. You can see the stem is really thick and then the flower was, it was squished. Yeah, it's a genetic hormonal thing that happened with it. So um, it's a bit different. So the light wasn't great in that one, but I really wanted to get a picture of the, mm -hmm. of the These flower. These are my friends. Yes. I save them. I, I do too from I my dog. If I find them on the road, I pick them up. Yeah. Them so the one on the left is just not interesting. Yeah. It's hard to even tell what it is, but I do love the way his feet are, are yeah. angled out. So that's, that's my eye level. And the one on the right is at his eye level. That one I actually took with my smartphone on selfie mode and I stood behind him and put my phone right on the ground in front of him. Oh. Um, and then I cropped my feet out because you could see I was, <laughs> I was straddling. So I didn't get down and lie on the ground, but I could see with selfie mode, I could see he was in the frame and I like that the foreground is blurry. Yeah. And then he's up on the, the top third. Cute picture. <laughs> he between my garden, my raised beds. Uh, don't split the lighting. Don't shoot in half light and half shade. Pay attention to your lighting. Um, so this one's in even lighting. Same arrangement of my garden, um, but consistent light. Either it, This one's in all full shade. And this one was taken in midday. Yeah. The light is glaring. It's just not a pleasing photo. Yeah. So try to avoid that afternoon light. And this one was taken in the nice, calm morning light, the golden hour, they call Did it. Did you take that with your camera? This one I took with my 35 millimeter camera. Uh -huh. Yep. This is one day I went out and you'll see, I've got a, a little slideshow that goes through, it's two and a half minutes at the end to music. And this one's in there. Um, I did it for a garden tour of the year. We didn't have tours in COVID 2020. Uh, so some of you may have seen it, but this one I took I went out specifically to take photos that morning because the light was beautiful and there was, it had rained and there was rain yeah. on all my flowers. So morning light makes for better photos. Yeah, the one, this one I took the same morning of the bee. It's one of my favorite photos. Uh, the one of the elk captured at probably 6.30 in the morning. You can see their breath. The sun is just coming through the treetops um, at our property in Oak Ridge. Makes morning light better than evening light. Or evening is the same, but they call it the golden hour. It could be either. I have a friend who does 
almost professional landscape photos. She, she could probably be a professional. She goes all around the country and does workshops with other professional photo photographers. And they get up at four in the morning and they go to their location and they shoot when the sun rises or sunset, but mostly morning. Um, so don't shoot in the dark. This isn't the greatest photo. I did not take this photo. This is from a different um, program, but it's a little bit dark, not all that interesting. They suggest, um, this is a, another one that suggests backlighting. Um, most of the time you want the sun behind you shining on your subject. But this is one where it can highlight, it can highlight a subject. Uh, these two I took with my phone just seconds apart. And get, that's why I say get to know your equipment. The one on the left is auto. And the one on the right I changed to manual setting. And it, it's awful. <laughs> um, but neither one is great. So check your settings. Take a lot of photos on different ones. Try it with flash. Try without flash. If you go to the settings on your camera on your smartphone, not your settings on your phone, but your camera, there's a lot of options, and I don't even know all of them on mine, but the, these, these two were just um, auto versus manual. I do most of my editing after I've taken it, and so I, I just leave my phone on, on auto most of the time and then edit on my computer. Don't use boring angles. And a lot of the times I went through hundreds of photos to, to make this presentation, and I'm like, why did I take that picture? I don't even remember what I was what the point was. So if you don't know the point of it, it's just to delete it, get rid of it. It's not interesting um, and boring. So try to find interesting angles. In most cases, it's gonna be getting in closer or changing the angle. There's, these are three different angles of the same part of my garden. Um, which do you prefer? So you, the static one, you know, it's almost straight on, kind of boring. I prefer the, the one in the frame, actually, I'm shooting through my fig tree um, where it's kind of all filled, but the angle one where it gets the curve of the bed is much more interesting than this one on the left. Um, find fresh angles. Like I said, a lot of times I get down below the plant or the salamander or whatever it is. I take a lot of pictures also from my deck that looks down on my garden like the other ones. This guy I followed around for an hour um, and, and I literally picked him up and put him in different locations if he wasn't <laughs> cooperating. But, you know, try many, many angles. I, I just don't get tired of it. So and it was a beautiful day and he was cooperative. I just took these two yesterday. I actually sat down on my front patio, which I don't think I've ever done before. <laughs> Um, and I looked through the plants more than looking, you know, at them or, or from above, like I do a lot from my deck. And I, I sat there and thought, wow, that's kind of a pretty shot. So try taking a portrait composition, the layout versus um, the landscape orientation that most of us are used to taking, um, where it gets a little bit wider. I actually prefer the portrait in this one. Um, don't see as much of that pot and so on. And I didn't crop either of these. That's, that's just the way they were taken. Try not to remember not to center something unless you are intentionally taking like of a um, leading lines or um, like a symmetrical photo that you really wanna capture that. Use that rule of thirds. Here's the one Alan suggested. If you're working at the desk and you're asking clients to email your photo, you their photos, ask them to check the focus, add something for scale, even if it's their hand. Um, take several photos of the same bug, a leaf, whatever their problem is, insect, get as close oh. as possible. And if it's a plant, take a photo of the leaf, the whole plant and then the surrounding area. Now, the, this one was actually posted on nextdoor.com and someone asked, what are these bugs? And answers came in varying from aphid to box elder bug. I mean, who can tell? It's first of all, they're backlit so you can't even see what color they are. Um, and it, I don't know how big that maple leaf is. It could be a Japanese maple, it could be a large one. So it's, it's not a good... Um, not a good way to send in a photo for ID. 
And how many of you download your photos all after you've taken them on your phone? Well, <laughs> that's where I um, that's where I do my editing. Uh, this one I cropped after I took it with my phone walking through the garden. I think this one might have. I think this was not taken on my phone. So do your editing once you're on your computer. It's much harder, and I don't even know how to really edit on my phone. Um, do your cropping, light control, and color once you've got them on your computer. It's so much, what are you using much easier. Edit? I will get there, Janet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are many editing software programs that can help you manage your photos afterwards. Some of them I just Googled, Photoshop, Lightroom, Adobe Plus, Affinity, and of course they all cost something. Um, the one I use is the Microsoft Photo software that is pre-installed on my computer. Oh. And it's just called Photo. And it's free and it's there. And you can also use, if you put your photos in Google Photo, any of you do that? Save them to Google Photos. Really? Oh, you can edit them in Google Photos as well. Um, I do that. I, I, my phone automatically, I have a, a Google account. My my line is a Google Fi. So mine automatically go to Google Photos. And then there is a software editing with Google Photos that you can manage them, um, which makes it much easier. But I'll show you what it, mine looks like. This is what I see on my computer in much smaller scale with my photo will be next to it. And I can straighten the photo like that one of my uh, pergola that was a little off kilter just by sliding this bar, and this isn't gonna work here, of course, sliding it left or right. I can rotate it, I can flip it. Hello? Question? No. Um, and then your aspect ratio is, you know, do you want it to be a four to three, five to seven? And then you can um, reset it. In your aspect ratio, you can also change it from uh, a landscape layout to a portrait layout and then crop it in. And another one, someone's not muted. And so this one, you, you see a portion of your photo and then you can just slide these back and forth. You'll see a light when you, when you bring up, if you put your, your photos in any software, it'll just say light and you can slide bar for the light just on your screen. But I just recently realized when you push the little down arrow on light here, all of these four choices come down. And then you can really control it by sliding the contrast or the exposure or the highlights or the shadows and really, really fine tune it. Or you can just push auto correct, which my son says, don't ever do that, mom. But um, so I don't ever do that. I, I mess with it a little bit and fine tune. And I have, I have gotten some photos that were very dark that I didn't think were savable mm -hmm. of, um, like a hummingbird. It was in my tree in the snow and it was very dark. I'd taken it with a telephoto lens and I, I was able to get it though. I think it was the one I showed that, um, it, it looked decent. Mm -hmm. So you can save them. Um, even if you think they might not be savable and then the things in color you can do the warmth the tint the clarity and some some programs are much much more detailed than this and some of you probably know more about it than I do but that's how I edit my photos um, so how can you improve as a photographer keep practicing just take pictures take them many 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 of the same flower different angles different light the same subject whatever it might be and then actually look at them when you're done <laughs> and throw away the ones that are bad. Keep the rule of thirds in mind. That's probably my number one um, rule of composition that I suggest, but there are exceptions to every rule like the symmetry rule I showed you. And who says a photo has to be a rectangle? Monet actually painted on round canvases. Uh, sometimes, and I'm, I meant to show, I meant to throw one in here, but experiment and have fun. Um, use a square um, format, and then please remember to throw away, discard, delete your bad photos. <laughs> These are photos I came across in my repertoire when I was making this. I I deleted. I am not kidding. 
probably at least a hundred photos that I had just, I just don't look at them all, all the time. I take the photos, I download them to my computer. And then when I have to do something like this, I look at them, but yeah, there, there were some really bad ones that I thought, why did I take that? So I'll play a little garden tour. And these are a lot of the photos I took on the same day in my garden. And then I'll go for questions. Can we hear the music? Oh, no music. Wait a second. What happened to my music? Ah, uh, bummer. Am I, I'm not muted. Hmm. Hold on. What's up? Well, we're going to enjoy the picture. It's much better than music, but I don't know why that is there. Is the speakers turned off? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> I do. Oh, that's a great picture. Now, did you take these all with a camera? Mm -hmm. uh, these I took with my digital camera, yes. Pretty much the same day. I think they were all taken the same day. Mm -hmm. And then went back and cropped, fixed the lighting, you know, and then put them to this. This, this little video was also through that same software on my, just Microsoft. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have it. Look, look, it's on my computer. It's longer than I thought. And that's the end. So, anybody have questions? How do I get out of this again? Escape. Where do I stop share, Alan? Oh, here we go. Yes. That's okay. So are there any questions from people? Um, I have a question. Ah, good. Yes. Is there a, a digital camera that you recommend? Um, I, I, like I said, my son has one that's that's a very new, just all digital. Um, I have a, I probably can't see my camera now. Can you mm. see me? I can see you. Okay. This is my camera that I've had for years. It's a Nikon. Um, yeah, we can turn the light back on. Uh, 5100 D 5100 um, with it's got my telephoto lens on it right now. Uh, it takes great photos, but um, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm not partial to any one 
brand. Like I said, I would just not recommend the point and shoot old timey. That's what I have. <laughs> Are you familiar with any of the, um, the telephoto that you can put on? Um, the smartphone? Yeah. I have not Repeat the question. Oh, so yes. Um, Carol asked if you, if I'm familiar with any of the lenses you can put on a smartphone and I'm not. Um, I know they have telephotos now. They're like almost like a magnet or something that yeah, or they slide in. I, my phone isn't that fancy, so I'm not familiar with. If anybody out there is, let me know. Hey, Nancy, can you stop sharing? I'm trying to. <laughs> how do I stop sharing? There we go. There. OK. Hey. Anybody else? Uh, yes. um, Leslie's got a question. Um, I take tons of photos. Because when I want to go find that flower or something, I'm just scrolling. scrolling. Well, Google, uh, Leslie said, asked if I have any suggestions for organizing photos. Um, I have a file on my computer that just says my garden. Um, but in Google Photos, that's the other great thing about Google Photos, I can search yellow flower. And every photo I've ever taken of a yellow flower will come up on Google Photos. I, yeah, so, and you can search for people's faces. I can search for, you know, a picture of my husband. It recognizes um, my dogs, anything. Um, but in, on my computer, I'm not as organized. I do have, I have them organized by year. Um, and so I can kind of go back and think when that was. But Google Photos is great because I can just scroll down through the years and find what I'm looking for. But the search thing is great. A lot of um, photo editing programs will allow you to put keywords in. Okay. And, and that helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that. You can, Alan said you can sometimes, photo editing um, programs will have keywords that you can put in to search. Um, some, Rich, you probably know more about that than I do. I don't, like I said, I'm not a tech, person, but um, I will tell you that the, the program I, I tend to just today. search one at a time, but I, um, it, you know, I do try and whenever I'm, you know, been someplace, I'll, I'll create a file specifically for that day or that, you know, couple of days or vacation, right. whatever it is. So it's easy to go back yeah. and find. Yeah. yeah. Rich said he, he will create a file for like, if he's been someplace for that day or and I do that for vacations to, you know, for, to different locations or we've been someplace. Yeah, um, I'll even do it on a hike because even if you like you're hiking in McDonald Forest, right? You've got like, you, you know, the trilliums were just in bloom right. a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, in the fall, right, you get all the maple leaves. So, so you do it by date? Uh, just even, you know, I, I, I date it so that okay. I know that I was in McDonald Forest on you know, April 16th or whatever, okay. or 16, you know, whatever date it is so that. And so you put I every photo you took. Generally find the season that I was. Yeah. Every photo you took that day on that hike. Right. In that box and that right. photo. That's a good idea. I take a lot of pictures with my iPad and it dates each picture. Hmm. And I can even put a title on the page. I took quite a few pictures of the various Japanese maples and I went back and I could put in the cultivar name on them. So I'm a real, real fan of, and you can even put them in folders like that. Yeah. So well, and even like you said, the, the um, camera or, or iPad, whatever it might be, um, has a file with that image in it and, it, and it's the, all the information is called metadata. So if you have a, you know, digital camera, it, it'll tell you, mm -hmm. you know, what the exposure was, what the right. shutter um, speed was, yeah, what, what the was focal thinking. length of your lens was, and, um, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of information that, that um, you can Take advantage yeah. of it. Oh yeah, I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm showing the people here now. I could I could share my screen again. Um, if you if you right click on a photo you've taken, it will tell you the date and size and dimensions. But 
it won't tell you the location unless you put that in. On, on um, my computer, I've got memories pop up from years back. And I just, I, some of them, I don't know where they came from. That's probably a Google photo thing. Yeah, they, they send me those like a three a, years ago today or pictures in there that you don't remember <laughs> were not taken by me or, or, or anybody at home have a question so i just wanted to say that i um i got uh those little lenses that you put on your iPhone for Christmas. Uh -huh. There's three lenses, a, a circular lens, so it's fisheye, a macro lens and a micro lens. Mm -hmm. And they were very inexpensive. They just slip over like my iPhone has, um, you know, two camera, two lenses on it. it. Slips over the first or the second one. I can't remember, but they're really fun. They're really, really fun for you. My problem is, of course, I don't carry my lenses and I carry my iPhone. I don't have them yeah. with me, but I, I have them sometimes for my garden, you know, and, and it, they're really fun. And okay. they're fun Good. around the house and, you know, whatever. They're they're really fun. And they are they were very inexpensive. I think they were like 20 bucks for three. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah. So they're, you know, for fun, <clears throat> they're a great thing. And I, I could, if anybody wants to email me, I could tell you what they are. I don't know right now what they are, but you could look them up online. I saw them, you know, advertised and went for, and Bob got them for me. Yeah. Okay. So she's got the smart, the iPhone lenses for her iPhone. She right. said they were only about 20 bucks. Yeah. Oh. For three lenses. Yeah. She said to email her. This is Susan Hoffman talking. Yeah. She got them for Christmas, but um, the iPhone lenses, fisheye, and I was going to play this again if I can with music. Let people. How do I share screen again? Uh, yeah, you, you got to be on Zoom. Green button at the bottom. This one. Share screen. It says share screen. Where is it? Uh, Zoom. No. Um, it would be, be on the bottom middle of your. No, you don't want to do that. There. Okay. And then. Um, Wait here. Should be a green button in your Zoom. There we go. Controls. Share screen. There. This one. Can you see that? Yep. Oh, still not working. the slideshow, but never mind. Over there. Um, oh, on the left hand, on the left -hand side. Click on that, and then it's already at a hundred. I don't know why it's not doing. Uh, it. Okay, that's all right. Uh, that's too bad. Okay. Any other questions? Gratitude. Yeah, that was helpful. I'm I'm gonna start cropping pictures because <laughs> and I that's a whole nother lesson that's you know to get it once to, to edit them on I could talk I could do a whole nother class on that, but uh, yeah, this was helpful. Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. People were going to unzoom or um turn you all off. I hope that you found this helpful. I certainly did. Yes, thank you, Nancy. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Good to see you. You too. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.